Good morning. Uh, welcome. We have uh, today. We have the tile installation solutions and systems for exterior project session. Um, a few things before we get started. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or please set them to vibrate. Uh, there will be scanning badges to confirm attendance and provide attendance certificates if necessary. So please make sure to have your badge scanned and if you need a record of your attendance for work or C CEU purposes. Um, visit the show floor for more educational opportunities or check the mobile, the mobile app for more details. So today we got three presenters. We have Woody Sanders. He is the president and owner of D.W. Sanders Tile and Stone Contracting based in Atlanta, Georgia. D.W. Sanders Tile and Stone Contracting is a NTCA five-star contracting firm that specializes in large and small bespoke stone and tile projects, both the new and remodeling sectors of the residential market. The strong technical underpinning of the company shows up in his motto, craftsmanship by the standards. We also have Martin Brooks of Her Heritage Marble and Tile and Tile Inspection Services. Martin has been an active in the masonry and tile industry since 1978. He's a recognized industry cons consultant, um, National Tile Contractors Association past president, and sits on the NTCA Technical Standards and Methods Committee and the ANSI A108 Committee. And he's also an active member of the Institute of Inspections, Certification, Restoration. And we also have Travis Smith, AKA the Porcelain Ninja. <laughs> He's of Heritage Land Landscape Supply Group. Travis has 25 years in the landscape industry as a contractor, manufacturer, and installer. So give these guys a warm welcome. Thank you. You, got, you need it? You need one more thing? Oh, I, oh, I have a mic. Oh, I, I don't know, I like to hog the stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome, we hope, uh, we're gonna try to bolt through this because I think we're gonna end up with a lot of discussion. So we're really gonna focus on one material, gauge porcelain tile pavers pretty heavily today. Uh, look, exteriors are becoming a great area for us. It has opened up, and I want Travis to touch on this, really on, on how much it's, because he was involved with the manufacturing side. He comes from, from the landscape side, so I think he's gonna bring some Great information for us today, but why? Why exteriors? Well, because it gives us opportunities. You're gonna to have to hit, we're going, if we're gonna make it. Go ahead, hit it. Think about it. With exteriors, we have to think about water management, expansion and contraction, unlike we have to in interior applications. We also have freeze thaw, and what we're gonna really focus on today is about drainage and drainage planes. I coined a phrase because I have no better way to think about it than that water hits, we build an assembly exterior, the water, hit, go, we slope it to drain, but we don't often think about how the simp, what happens when the water migrates through the paver or the tile or whatever we're doing and where we're handling there, so we'll focus in on that. In that. That could lead to, if we don't manage this to this, freeze thaw damage, efflorescence, and the improper material and the improper application, which leads to damage from chemical exposure or our favorite saltwater pools that don't say they have much salt, but apparently they have more salt than we think they do and than that. So we won't get into reflective today or, or heat exchange, all that. So, all right, we'll hit the next one. Oh, the, so we're going to focus the discussion, gauge <coughs> porcelain tile pavers, what they are, where they're used, how they can be used, different installation, and we're going to do oh, six case studies very quickly. Uh, loose laid will be, is probably what's new to us, and the reason we call it loose laid versus dry laid, which I realize the material is dry because we really cover those information in dry set standards versus wet set standards. So that's why we're gonna talk about, it's the terms are now being used out of ANSI called loose laid. Um, <clears throat> we are going to show a, uh, something that was new to us is over that. Over that. Um, what are gauge porcelain? Well, ANSI is defined for it. It's a class of tile panel that has been manufactured to a specific nominal th thickness greater than 
or equal to 20 millimeters, which would be three quarters to us Americans, and that um, and whose thickness and characteristics are largely associated with how they're used. And that I want to focus in on that just one second. Manufacturers of these materials, and if you pull nothing away from this today other than this, manufacturers of these particular materials or class of gauged porcelain pavers will tell you what they can and cannot do. You can't decide that for yourself. And that um, it, it does have a standard, A137.3, which was adopted in July of 22. And I want you to look at, there's all everything they've got to hit. Hit it twice more for me. Except I want to focus in on, no, one back, please. On that. And this will, and we'll bring this up a little later. These are two new tests that were developed specifically for these type of materials, and that, and we'll talk about them in a little bit long. And that um, available sizes, shapes, jump in here, Travis. I mean, where are we using them? Here? Yeah. So as far as uh, as far as the design capabilities, design sizes, styles, options, uh, the nice part for the landscape industry, which is where I come from, but it's a great design benefit for everyone, is the fact that. Um, Modern technology is really revolutionizing an ancient process of porcelain, right? So uh, my previous company coined a term called continuity in and out. So now there's the availability for a customer to come through, look at a hotel, for example, look at the wall behind the concierge desk, look at the floor, right? Then be able to carry that same look, tone, texture, color, whatever you like about that one particular look, carry out to the breezeway, out to the patio, to the pool, and create a continuity in and out that you could not do with other available products prior to porcelain really making this advent over the last few years. So um, for a specifier, an architect, quite literally, you can grab really any great manufacturer hitting the standards that Woody, that Woody already discussed, ANSI 137s and, and whatnot, and make an entire selection with a ton of variety and tone and texture out of one catalog. It, you know, it just, it refines the process. It allows you to do things that you weren't able to do. You know, when's the last time you looked and said, oh, those are great concrete pavers. I want to go vertical with them. I mean, you're never going to do that. But you can really take that design aspect to the next level with what Porcelain's now offering. You're looking at manufacturers with seven, eight, nine hundred SKUs. I don't know, how many of you guys got now? 1,200? 1,200 SKUs in one Porcelain manufacturer. There's a great, there's a lot of great manufacturers. So, the, you know, the world is your oyster. You can design what you want with current porcelain. It's just, about, let's talk about this. You, you and I were in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and the paving, when, it, when this started introduced, that obviously that we have stone as paving, we, yep. we have concrete pavers as paving and that, but, and then there was some concern once the porcelain kind of hit into the marketplace, right? Yeah, that, so uh, the hardscape market, which would be consistent of natural stone and concrete pavers for the last, I don't know, 20 years um, has been approximately 2 billion square foot available nationwide as far as what's sold. So landscape wholesale yards, stone yards, when we brought porcelain in, they were really concerned, you know, how, how's this going to affect our other business? And, and you know, we kind of said, well, we think it's going to affect the stone business. We don't think we're going to eat into the concrete paver business just because that's a commoditized item. What ended up happening is over the last three years, the natural stone business has grown. NCMA is reporting record numbers for concrete pavers, so that market hasn't grown. And porcelain numbers you're seeing, depending on the manufacturer, 30 to 60% growth year over year for the last five years, give or take. <clears throat> so what we realize now is, and our guesstimation from, from those in the industry is, we've created about another billion square foot of available real estate for hardscapes that we never even knew were available prior to porcelain coming. So, you know, we see hardscape yards be willing to stock it, stock porcelain pavers, and realize that it hasn't changed the rest of their business. It's only added to it. So porcelain hasn't even eaten into the old hardscape market, hardly at all, except in maybe a few key cases like maybe travertine, where availability went down, porcelain was able to kind of take that advantage. But as a whole, it hasn't bothered the market as a, in general. It's actually just grown it. So that, that, that's really why this slot exists, right? We've got new locations and new opportunities. How many guys are tile contractors in the room? Yay, hold your hand. great. I just gave you a new avenue of making money, right? Because typically tile contractors have fairly been limited to interior, wet and dry areas and that, but now there's this whole opportunity that we have in that. Let's go to the next one. But, but just to note to that, with new opportunities come new problems. 
<laughs> and we're going to get to that later. But that, gives we, you, we, that gives you a job, but you're not one you really want. Right. So. <laughs> but because we're at the front end of this technology or new opportunities, there's also a learning curve that goes with that. We need to be very aware of that. And we need to follow what the manufacturers say, and we need to be very careful on the choice of materials we use. So bear that in mind as we move forward. Absolutely. I think that's very important. This, this is just showing some pictures of different places in interaction. We're going to start off. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time other than the fact that I want to really focus in on more uh, uh, drainage on the, in, these, in these applications. Well, one, of the, one of the reasons why these new technologies have, have taken off or the new opportunities take off is be, because we've failed so much in old technologies that don't work anymore or they have failed so bad that nobody ever wants to go back to that. So roof decks, et cetera, where natural stone's been used and they've not had a drainage plane underneath, it's caused problems with efflorescence and just looks horrible, people don't want to do that anymore. And this creates a new opportunity for those who want to, to get into the pedestal system or uh, especially with the loose laid too, so. Right. Um, this is just, we'll jump back. This, uh, this will try back? feed into the pedestals here in a little bit. This is the same project. I want you to keep this in mind. This is just a mud bed system with full, full uh, membrane, optional F101 with optional full membrane. We pull screens, pull mud. Uh, you see the membrane on the fall right. Uh, the one thing is if you're going to do any hard bonded, is that a fair enough word, hard bonded, mm -hmm. we'll call it that. Let's move one more slide. And that, here's what you got to work. Layout established, installation begins, coverage. Standard is 95% or greater. We won't go there. Uh, in that, what you've got to get that coverage. Can you achieve that coverage? Absolutely. But you've got to pick the right trial size. You've got to understand you're dealing with Super, if we call a large format anything over 15 inches, most of these tiles are 24 by 24, 24 by 48. They certainly make some, some smaller sizes, but they're pushing and everything's going to larger, less grout joints. So dealing with this. Well, let's remember, these are permanent installations with a limited lifespan. Just digest that. Permanent installations with a limited lifespan. Yeah. So these are not going to last as long as you're building. These probably have a lifespan of maybe 20 years before the membrane starts to degrade and you've got to pull all that out. And then if you're in a high rise and you're 50 stories up, that's a lot of work to take out these bonded systems that have a limited lifespan. You're exactly right. All right. Um, final installation. So that, that, that's, uh, that was the final installation there. This will tie into another project we put up. We did this last summer. I, want to, I did want to show this. Uh, mainly, this is F-102 with a drainage layer. So this was existing concrete walkways. We had sheared off um, flagstone from these concretes. This, what you're seeing here, are slab on gray. This is the rendering coats we put on it to, to push water where we wanted them. Wanted to. What we're thinking in this case is how we're going to handle the water after it gets into the assembly. Um, here it goes. Here's how we do it. They are now proprietary manufacturers. This is a non proprietary. Uh, <coughs> venue right now for us. We're not really, tr we're not trying to promote anybody, but I just wanted to make you aware of. So here's an installation of a drainage mat. This particular manufacturer, we loose laid this over our rendering. So we've got to correct the substrate before we deal with, uh, with the drainage layer. So it's, it, you see the guys, they're putting it down. Um, it's a recent innovation. Their particular manufacturers are starting to, to think this way. Uh, the mat is load bearing, it's loose laid, it's manufactured, and we follow their specifications. Just, we'll, just to add that, though, the misconception is these drainage layers move water. They will not move water no. without a slope. So you can't just loose lay a membrane and expect it to manage water and take it away. If the, if the area is flat, the water is just going to stay in the drainage mat. It's not going to move. Right. If, you, if we <laughs> jump back to, we jump back to, yes, so excellent point and that. Uh, we're correcting the substrate that we started with first before we're putting the drainage layer, drainage layer in, in that. <coughs> I, I, I inspect many jobs where uh, natural stones used uh, right above a drainage plane. The drainage plane is not being put in correctly. Water stays under there, and it will destroy the stone. You'll see efflorescence, and it's just no one wants to ever go there again. Right. It's just right. bad. As two so, people in my audience know, no, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. This is a, this is a bit. 
This is just the, yeah, this is a continuation of this. Uh, you see it's in progress over the drainage layer. Coverage, hit it again. No, by the way, no room for error. On these systems, there's no room for error. You need the coverage. You, got you need as close to 100% as you possibly can. Any voids in there, it's gonna hold moisture. If it's not so much with porcelain, but with natural stone, you're gonna see a lot of problems. Hit it again. Coverage. Coverage is key. Coverage is key. Cover and, and understand, the other thing is, the, this is a proprietary method from a proprietary manufacturer with proprietary mortars. So you can't just say, I'm gonna pull this drainage layer and this mortar and that, it is an this, assembly This design. is not a hybrid system. This right. is one manufacturer who's saying, if you follow this method, it will work. I think you can't, it's not a mix and match. It is not. All right, I think we go. Here's finished installation. Uh, continue with installation fit. The only th reason I put up this slide, this is natural stone other than in paper <clears throat> because it is in ashlar. The one thing is we actually pipe in and bag in our grout in this particular type of installation. We will not full spread this grout. One of the big things that I notice is the misuse of membranes right now where um, because they've being, become so popular that they're being misused, they're being used inappropriately. Yeah. They work, I'm not, I'm not saying that they don't work, but they're used inappropriately. And that's causing a lot of problems out there with exterior products being used outside. Uh, the arrows are just, uh, again, w w because we rendered the, in the slab, we corrected. Uh, remember, I'd use that coin primary drainage. Water is going to hit this, and it's going to, and we've, we've pushed with the, rendering the, the concrete to the dr existing drain, but we've also are handling the water once it hits that drainage mat. It's just like a shower pan system, it's water management. You need to get that water away as quickly as you can from underneath the tile substrate. Yeah. All right, test, quick vocabulary lesson, right? Because this is new to us and Travis knows it. Loose laid, we kind of went into that. We aren't setting this in, with thin set or a mortar set. We're, we're actually loose laying these materials. Geotextiles, there's something real new. It's not new, but new. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> yeah, ge geotextiles. <laughs> this man knows all about geotextiles. Uh, geotextiles are permeable fabrics which are used in association with sole stabilization, or they can be used in a way of separating different aggregates. Correct. Can, can we just touch on that and let Travis yeah. explain that? Yeah, 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 like yeah. New to so, me too. Yeah. Uh, geotextile fabric, right? So. Again, we use it to uh, separate gravels from native soils and also separate our base materials from the material that's getting put on top. So in this case, the porcelain would be the veneer that goes on the surface. Um, a real good test. Geotextiles need to move water, as these guys just touched on. Water management's key. So if you're unsure, spread some out on the ground, spray it with a hose. If the water doesn't go through immediately, that's not the material you need to be using. Typically a non-woven is the way to go, a non-woven fabric, so gray, uh, gray looks like kind of hairy material, uh, very important. The quality of the material does need to be at least, at a minimum, uh, they'll give ratings on the side, whether it be a three-year, five-year, ten-year. At a minimum, you want to have a five-year fabric. That just means that that fabric's going to be thick and gauged enough to take the abuse that we're going to give it of putting it on native soils and then putting aggregates on top of it and compacting it, okay? Go ahead and go into aggregates. Because that's, so, that's real unusual to us. Yeah, so, all right, <laughs> aggregates. So, depending on the availability in the marketplace. So, I've got a really good friend of mine here from Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia area. And his available aggregates in a marketplace are very different than what we could get, say, in Charlotte or Atlanta, and especially in Orlando. So, uh, 57, 67 stone, stone that's around three quarters approximately of, of an inch, all the way to an 89, 78, which is a, about a quarter inch coarse aggregate. Um, it depends on the amount of moisture you're looking for what's to, to move through the, the base material itself and also how much work you want to put in on. Obviously we have to screed this material as flat as possible. So using three quarter inch stone gets much, 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 much more difficult to screed it flat, get it compacted and tamped. Where if you use a 78 or an 89 stone, you know, approximately that large, we can screed it, get it compacted quite easily. Um, also, we'll start getting into, you'll hear people refer to things like crusher run, which is coarse aggregate with a lot of fines, and then we'll get into M10 or granite screenings, and then C33 concrete. They all have their place, depending upon the application at hand, 
and they all have their drawbacks depending on the application at hand. So uh, I don't know if we have enough time to cover some of that today, but if you guys have questions about which aggregates and what applications, let me know. I'd be happy to do it and, and go over with you, but there, there's a lot of variance depending on what you're trying to achieve, okay? I digested about 5% of that, so I'm going to have you a number on speed dial so I can call you anytime. <laughs> <time. laughs> uh, go ahead and flip I it. I mean, that, 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 that is really a lot of information to take in, but it's pertinent to my industry because I'm seeing a lot of loose laid that are now exhibiting the same problems as a direct bond. And people are saying, well, it's just on, hard, it's just on softscape, it's on sand, or you know, it's just laid, but the, it, it, the same failures are occurring. Why is that? Sure. And it's all through water management and drainage below that surface. Yep. If that surface, that sand's gonna hold water, it's gonna create the same problems as a direct bond. Yeah, and when you're looking at manufacturing uh, drawings that you see from different manufacturers, whoever it may be, understand that they have really great marketing departments, that their job through marketing is to sell every application possible so that they have more applications for their material to be sold. Um, those applications are painted with very broad brushes. And although certain applications may be industry accepted standards, that does not mean that that's the viable ap application for the job at hand. Uh, so it, there are some variances, especially depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with any of you guys offline about any, you know, wherever you're at, what might be the best application. My, my take is also a, as, as something that looks very simple and is typically done by someone who's probably not involved in standards or methods as a landscape gardener who could be doing many things. Um, it's kind of above the pay grade right now yeah. and it's getting more complicated which is causing more problems but they're the ones who are getting the work. Correct. And that's not doing any justice to the industry. Correct. Because people are not happy with the end product. Correct. And that's where I think the education and training and even if we have to dig deeper and get to those people somehow to make it better for everyone that's what we need. We need to outreach. Yeah, and if let we them, level the playing field yes. for, for everybody involved, yeah. yeah. Because once we do, then obviously it raises every, they realize that they have to do a little bit more work and they need different materials, and the cost what they're bidding it at is more in line with the guy who's bidding it right because he knows what to do. Correct. Having said that, we'll move to loose <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, to Travis's point, right, uh, we're obviously in Georgia. We deal with this fine product called Red, red Georgia Clay that has about zero uh, permeability <laughs> in that. Dig a pool, put some water in, you get red water, right? Yep. And that this is a project we did, um, I think we'll show it in the pedestal, because it, it, here's an interesting thing for the new area's new location. This one project we did, loose laid, pedestal, <laughs> and hard set with porcelain pavers on this one project. And that it was a uh, contract amount was over a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, we were on, on and off. Actually, we got to go back for another part of it. it this job keeps on giving. And um, um, but I this, like those jobs. Yeah, we like these jobs. <laughs> and that uh, just real quick, one thing with loose laid, you're going to see this, and we'll t you're going to touch on this real heavy containment, right? How are you going to contain it? And that it's a floating system if it can, and if it can wash off and if it's not handling drainage and if you don't contain it, we contained this particular job with granite curbing. Um, 57 was placed in, it's compacted. And that then we came over with a non-woven geotextile. Uh, I, I actually, I had to call a landscape buddy to find out which one to put on it. And that, I think it was Travis. Uh, and that, uh, we compacted. Travis would disagree with this. I was comfortable with this. This is M10 because I wanted to screed this tight and I wanted this hard set and this loose laid, but I wanted to be tighter in this because I had the drainage layers, but no, believe it, and I was not going to be using polymetric. Yep. This is a wide open joint. So that can be, I, I won't, we won't get too deep into that, but it is a consideration. This, is, this was meant to be an ungrouted system. It was just going to be open joint system. Uh, screed, level, next picture will show us continuing. Yeah, this is a set point. Loose laid systems still need a way of maintaining joints. Because this is kind of new to us, my setter put the spacers in on top of the tile instead of under them and that. So we had to pull it up and reset. So the so. good thing about that is though, you didn't <laughs> yeah. lose everything. You, you, so the you pictures saved are, tile. at least the dailies picked up he was not doing it right so I could get him correct. And then you see the second, <laughs> you see the second series in the bottom. If you hit the, I think I red line, well, back one, Martin, sorry. The bottom, you see the spacers being set in them and, and left there. 
So in a loose laid system, and there are manufacturers now making, actually believe it or not, those spacers are coming out of the pedestal systems and we're just reusing them for a different way. There are some manufacturers now making di different, different systems. So, right. And then f finished product, uh, we never get real good about. But this is how that whole project kind of turned out. If I, I think we'll have some pictures to the left. Was hard set above on the upper deck is that. I want you to really jump in on this. Sure. This is your side. Yeah, so um, when we talk about loose laid from the landscape industry, what we're used to doing is taking concrete pavers and putting 5,000 PSI plate tampers and pounding sand and driving sand into the joint process, which is why it's called interlocking concrete pavers. That's actually what causes them to interlock. Um, the issue that you run into with porcelain is it's susceptible to a fulcrum. Although you have, we have material that's able to take three, 4,000 pounds of breaking strength. Um, when you plate tamp them, if you get a high spot or a, or a valley, you have the, you have the chance of, of cracking that tile. Plus, for guys like myself that are used to literally finishing a surface and putting a car on it immediately. All right, we're good. We're vehicular. Let's drive a car on it right now. That's just not, a loose laid system is not going to allow you to make a vehicular application out of porcelain. So we're used to just something that's ridiculously firm. So there are some new systems out. This is one particular one called Silka Soil Grid. Um, it's a 13 by 13 grid. It's about an inch and a quarter thick. And if you can take a look, go back for me one real quick, Martin. Yes, um, if you see in that, you see it's a grid system with cross members across it. So what's actually happening is you're dispersing the weight and compaction of the tile and the filled grid across it. So now we are taking the, the, the weakness of the fulcrum breaking, breaking tensile strength, excuse me, of porcelain and we're spreading that out. Right? Well, we're, we're I think you have to think, right? Keep in mind, these are gauge porcelain pavers and they are allowed a certain amount of wedging. Absolutely. They're not, and, and in essence, what we deal with with gauge uh, large and heavy tile mortars and that, and we kind of adjust that or back trialing or uh, back notch trialing is what we're calling it now, and that you're, you're still playing with that. Yep. That's still played out. Yep. So you've got to kind of allow for that and how you're going to keep these things supported. Absolutely. And, you know, also when we talk about aggregates, we can't take an aggregate, a coarse aggregate. We can use M10 like Woody just showed you and screed a perfectly flat surface to lay the tile on. When you use an aggregate, you can't get it perfectly flat like you'd be used to doing a mud set application, right? So this grid kind of allows us to take something that was loose laid and when you see the installation process, you'll see that we can create one interlocking monolithic surface. So it gives us a lot of ability that you can't get with gravel. So you can go to the next slide. So simply put, depending on where you're at in the country, whatever your typical excavation depth would have been, four inches, eight inches, 12 inches, depending on where you're at for freestyle, you can automatically cut that depth in half. So if you were gonna do an eight inch uh, depth bed, go to four, again, get the native soils. Martin likes the key on this, compact native soils. Don't just dig a hole and say we're good. Native soils, regardless of it be clay, sand, loam, they must be compacted, mm -hmm. okay? Lay a layer of drainable geotextile fabric down, layer of gravel down, screed it out. In this particular instance, they did use a crush and run, which is fine. Laid that out and screed it, lay the grid on top. Next slide. Then the grid is filled with a finer material. I'm a bigger advocate of a coarse, fine aggregate. So something around a quarter inch that fills in nice and neat, <laughs> allows us drainage. It's spread out, then a layer of fabric put across that again. Next slide. And then the material is laid down and glued down to the fabric. Now, I know for a thin set guy, you know, tile guys, tile setters that have been using thin set for all the years ago, I don't, this doesn't kind of jive. I didn't think this was going to work very well the first time I used it either. I kind of said, ah, it's a little hocus pocus, I don't know. And the very first job I installed, I was blown away with how firm, how dense, and how well connected and bonded these were just through using a porcelain rated adhesive on top of fabric. It's unbelievable. So we actually did some jobs with this. Next slide. This one's in Johns Island, South Carolina. Yeah, I threw that one in for you because I you. knew the keen people in the room would know that with that's, concrete pavers that were going through yeah, the process. That's a big yeah. deal. This one's a very big deal because this is in Johns Island, South Carolina. Native soils are 100% sand. This is on the ocean. And uh, this particular patio has experienced multiple hurricanes in the last 24 months, multiple with an aggregate base on that type of grid, not one tile has moved, set, settled, or drifted at all. 9,500 square feet. 
And that was the contractor's very first job they ever did with it. If you're going to go hardscapes, I highly recommend, and going a loose laid over aggregate, I highly recommend some of the systems that are out there that are not foam boards. We do not recommend the foam boarding anymore, which you'll run into, but a grid system, okay? We're back to a vocabulary lesson. Go, you want to do, do this one? You want to do this one? Well, we'd, uh, you, I'll let you take I'll it. I'll let me do the vocabulary lesson. Like, That's pretty cool because I couldn't even pass third grade spelling. And that. So, a pedestal. Well, you start with the first one. I'll do the second one. All right, all right. We'll start with the first one. Pedestals, what are they? They are a great product that I love. Besides that, they actually are manufactured, generally made to support. Um, they're made of thermal plastics. They are come in multiple components, uh, for and they actually handle slope. And this is going to become like I would call this a honey hole, if I will. And not that, all are created equal. Remember, not, that. they are not. They are not. They are not created equal. There's no that. standard for what they're used that. for. Is if you think about it today, people want to walk out of their, onto their patio or out of their house or onto their deck, and they don't want to walk on a slope. They want to walk on a nice level plane. This is what a pedestal does. A pedestal compensates for slope already in place. And that, so they are, so that's what they're essentially for. They come multiple components and it can get extremely complicated, and, but the manufacturer's done a great job of making this, this orderly. You get to talk about containment because it's like our favorite word when it comes to pedestals. Well, containment, I think, is something that people are not considering when they do a pedestal system. And if you've not got edge containment, you, we've got a video a little bit later that shows, even in San Francisco, wind uplift, which can be really scary. But edge containment is really important to keep that system in place. If you don't have edge containment, it's going to move around. It's not going to be supported on the edges. It's going to fail. Uh, implosion, that's a fun new word for us. Um, consider that these tiles or these gauge porcelain papers are supported on pedestals in a generally on the four corners. Uh, on a 24 by 24, th this actually becomes very manufacturer driven. It could be if it was a 24 by 48, you would have six points of, of, of points of load. Yeah, you're, uh, you're generally looking for a point of contact per square foot. Right. That's, that's the general manufacturer's recommendation. Right. Right, and, and, and if they aren't supported, they implode, and this can become dangerous. And so. on that point, some manufacturers are now requiring a mesh backing on that to limit, it's not to help the system, it's to limit liability, if I understand that correctly. That's absolutely right. Because if anyone falls through that pedestal system, and I know you've done some really high, that can be really uh, yeah. catastrophic to whoever falls through Yeah, that. we've done as pedestal systems as high as 30 inches. So the cavity beneath the tile and that were, was 30 inches. And there was a lawsuit that settled back in this year. Yeah, so there's a, a multi-million multi dollar lawsuit. I can't dis divulge any of the information. But basically, um, it was at a football stadium, and a worker dropped a keg of beer from a third rack, hit the tile that was unsupported with no mesh, made a microfracture, had no idea that it was there, put the keg back on the, the, the rack, basically. Well, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little, uh, and went back to work. The next day, uh, during a game, a lady stepped on that. There was a micro fracture, 185 stitches later and six pints of blood. Um, you know, and all because they didn't spend a few extra dollars per square foot for a mesh backing. That basically what the mesh backing does is if a catastrophic failure, failure happens, it causes the material to stay together like a car windshield and collapse not to have all these broken, sharp shards everywhere. So at a minimum, you need to be looking at that. If we were to go back to that early A137.3 slide, that is where this gets important. These tiles are tested to a standard. Well, not all tiles, only the ones that are manufactured to that standard. We have to remember the right. 137 only applies to tiles that meet that standard. We know there are some on the marketplace that are probably not made to that standard, and that standard does not apply to those tiles. That, that's why you need to be with reputable manufacturers. That's why you need to look at the data sheet to make sure and look at your information that you're given. Not, not all tiles are created equal either. There's other ways that it's dealt with. Some of the manufacturers are using uh, anything from trays that are adhered to the back of the tile with marine-grade adhesives. 
Uh, this will also play into wind equalization or uplift. They're, they, right, they, they, uh, so th there are peel and stick membranes in some cases that can be used on the back of the tiles, but this is all, again, manufacturer driven and you have to work. Th this is why I know Travis. This is why I know other people in the room that you cannot go out here. You're, I am not qualified to engineer that system. Right. right. But never talk yourself out of a, a, a system either because there are solutions typically for the, like the, the fiber grate, the, the, Absolutely. the trays underneath. Right. Or if you feel nervous or you don't feel that you can do that system, there's probably a solution that you can. Uh, yeah. You just got to get out there and ask your manufacturers to give you that solution. Yeah, and as we talk about this stuff, I don't want any of you guys to think that this is an overcomplicated, any process we're talking about is not a very difficult application. There are some, there's some highly technical knowledge that you need to know intricacies, to avoid intricacies, right. yeah, to avoid the pitfalls that the rest of the industry has already done. So we now know what the problems are. Don't, don't let us scare you. That's not the intention. Uh, we just, there's information you must know. Right, and, th and this slide really just kind of is addressing what we're talking about. What does an implosion look like? Well, the bottom left and upper right, that's what implosion looks like. The tile breaks, but it doesn't go through. It keeps it to where the tile, understand loose laid, you just unscrew some things, pull it out, replace it. Understand this is part of it, and, 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 and it can happen. It, it just, we just don't want people to get hurt. Uh, the upper left side, if hit it again, I think it shows, now nah, I'll go back. I'm sorry, I don't always know my own slides. What, the difference between the upper left side, this is that same job we did the, the loose laid on that you saw earlier. This is the upper deck being run in pedestals. In this particular case, we went to a fifth pedestal. And that, so that can be another way we can address, address, address. Just to touch on that, where was that fifth pedestal placed? In the center, yep. like a dice. So, so the problem with the fifth <laughs> pedestal in the center, if it's not dialed in correctly, it could be a pivot point. And that pivot point then will create you've point load. Yeah. And so you've got to be careful on that fifth one because if you can't reach under that tile and you can't, you can't know that you've got full support, you're, you, you could be a millimeter too low or even worse, you could be a millimeter too high. That's a which 16th is, in America. Which, which, yeah. <laughs> two centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick, don't let this picture scare you too much either. The new revamped standards that we got from ANSI as a ASTM C648 test, I think it is. So now those tiles in the testing are supported on two sides with a bar press in the middle, and they must exceed 3,000. 3, I think, I think it's 3,000 pounds breaking strength now. So they're very strong. This is the worst case scenario, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, right? Just to make a point here, like a pedestal system may not be a one undone. A building's organic, it's moving. The pedestals may move, it, need, it may need fine tuning over sure. time. Sure. And you never want to leave it for a prolonged period of time with a pivot point or point load if that tile is not supported on all four corners. Right. You've got to make sure that there's probably a maintenance program attached somehow to that installation. Sure. So that you can go back and check from time to time to see if it's performing like it should. But, and then you see the mesh back that Travis was referring to. This, that, that's actually was Travis's tile in that particular case. <laughs> um, here we talked about the, uh, the plates. These are just different backing plates. Uh, or trays, one's a backing plate, one's a tray, both do the same thing as far as dealing with the, the potential of implosion. Uh, but uh, trays are typically being used in wind equalization. I think the next thing is... And what uh, we find too is these are usually driven by uh, problems or you know, like lawsuits that evolve the industry and then we try to rectify it. It's typically not proactive, it's reactive. So as this technology is getting more popular, we may keep seeing it evolve forward. We will. As new we will. systems, new new designs, new methods. We will. Oh, uh, this is a fake video, is what we ultimately. But it, but it makes a point. Hit it. Hit it. It'll show the video. That's downtown San Francisco, just three weeks ago. Yeah. That's a sofa flying across the skyline, and nearly hits a guy right on the street there, right in the bottom. Oh. And who would believe that could happen in San Francisco? This is the world we live in now. This is reality. That we're putting these systems in a place where we never thought uplift would occur to this degree. And we were getting between 70 and 90 mile an hour gusts. Yeah, but here's what we found out. The video was fake. Oh, it's fake? It's fake. Hmm. It's fake. But it makes the How point. How did you find that? 
because the, because because my email when this video hit social media, my email blew up because people know I'm into pe in pedestals, and then other people got with people, and then they found out they analyzed that it. actually it's a fake video. But what it does do is make a good point about wind equalization because that's exactly what would happen. And that there's a long story to it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, to that point though, the, the same time windows were blowing out of the Bank of America building. Yep. It, it, like we had four or five uh, incidents where windows blew out of buildings. Right. And never blown out before, but they popped out of the Bank of America and came down 26 floors. Right, right, right. Well, so this is really well, believable. It, it may be fake. It, but it, it is, is but, but I didn't find it out until the slide was already built. So I'm. Keep in mind, too, uh, <laughs> most major cities have got quote unquote wind engineers, guys that are actually, well, it depends on where you're at, what they're called. But regardless, there are pockets of cities where it's a city you would never imagine had a wind uplift issue, but because of the architecture and the construction of the buildings, they cause these funnels and gunnels that run through where a small wind can then get channeled. Yep. And I've seen it personally Vortex. in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. which is not a, a highly concernable wind uplift city until you get into a 10 block area where it's extremely dangerous. And the way we found out was 36 pound tiles dropping from the 25th story. My, my, my takeaway from that though, had they done an edge containment or they'd have adhered it on the edges properly, you probably wouldn't have got that one peel Correct. off which allowed Correct. the vortex underneath and allowed it to yep. uplift. Absolutely. Right? So uh, there's things uh, that you can do to prevent from that. Uh, it, won't, it won't fully get you out of the liability. But by doing it right and putting things in there, you're probably going to stop it peeling back. Because once one peels back, they're all peeling. They're yeah. all peeling back. I, I think what we want to leave with you, because boy, we could go on with it when equalization. I think what we <laughs> want to kind of li li leave you with is this: is a, don't be scared of it. There are the, the manufacturers are addressing this. This isn't something new. At B you've got to look at the local codes and standards because certain areas and regions won't and will. So you got to be aware of it. You just got to do your research and see, uh, it, 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 it's just a matter of addressing it, addressing the wind equalization. And this is, I think, kind of some of the ways that gets addressed. The, the bottom right is tray, it, the adhesive, and, it, and then it uses splines on the pedestal. Uh, the, you see, again, the tray, it's being done on the pedestal with a grommet system on the uh, top right. Um, then the bottom left is actually a locking uh, system and you see the splines and those components it, it's really but I would say this it's engineered it's thought out it's planned for and then it's just executed most um, of the time you see the specs they've already been written out of where your pressure zones are what type of wind uplift you need to have um, just something you need to know about it'll typically be written out for you this is the, oh, uh, one thing this you'll see the blue the blue errors hitting two different things um, that's called bridging, is what we call it, a neat term. Um, when, you ha when a pedestal is going to allow a land into a drain area, uh, I think those are overflow drains in this particular case for us, um, we're actually using pedestals to hold up fiber grate, to hold up pedestals, to hold up tile. And that, so that's called bridging, and it, and it, and it's going to, and it's you're going to have to, it's going to be a part of almost every job. Um, the other thing is we're looking at our, our my favorite for, term and, uh, is containment. In this particular case, actually, believe it or not, this was a concrete deck over steel pan that we came in and pulled mud beds underneath the primary waterproofing membrane and pitched the concrete deck back to center drains, which you kind of see in the in the in the middle there. And then the waterproofing contractor came in and put the the, the this is a PVC membrane. Um, then we installed the blue stone as containment. So containment isn't always ugly. It can be actually, it was designed by a landscape architect and, and the, what, the boots were put and then, we, then the glass rail would go up and then we would start the pedestal installation. You know, one, one thing I've experienced, I got, got a, a deck to do in, on a pedestal system with pavers, the guy wanted it perfectly flat, level, everything. Didn't want to feel a rock on his chairs, wanted it flat. There's a point. We did it, it was perfect. They put all the edge containment in, got it all done. The first range came, water tension, kept water on the top. He called me up, he's like, hey, I got water standing on my tile. I don't like, I got puddles now when I walk out. It's like, I don't know what to do. We got edge containment everywhere, what do I do? The solution was, I got him a squeegee. I went to Home Depot and got him <laughs> yeah, a squeegee. Because right, right. at that point, there was nothing I could do, and I had to explain to him, it's not doing any damage, 
But because you wanted that deck perfectly flat, no water's gonna drain off it. And you can have undulations in that porcelain tile, and water tension itself will keep puddles on there. So when you walk out in your bare feet and your, or your socks and you're complaining they're getting wet, I'm sorry, without a fall on that deck, I'm, I'm, I can't do anything for you. Well, I think, I think that makes a point because we're moving to 2448s. Yep. We're seeing 48 by 48s getting ready to hit the market. Yep. Um, and, and, that, and, and, and people want the flat decks. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there's a give and take. We'll give Not you something. Not only flat, yeah. but level. Level, level, yeah. right. You, you, give, you give them the flat level deck, which is nice when you're sitting out there on the outdoor patio and your glass of wine isn't tilting, listing, right? There's, a, there's that side of it. And that, but we take it away, right? We, we're creating a drainage layer, but we're only within a 48 inch by 48 inch place. Well, so I, would, I would also recommend uh, a squeegee coming from the grade, <laughs> coming from the at grade side of things. Uh, produce a little area for a client that says, I want it perfectly flat. Give them something to stand on that's at a 2% slope. They will not know. They will not be able to tell standing there's a 2% slope and water will drain off of most porcelain tops with a 2% slope, yeah. period. Um. I think this is more like detail. This is the job. Continue. Oh, I, I did. I did. For those who think uh, pedestal can't support good weight and can't be manipulated, these are holes that were draw, drilled in because they had mosquito misting, <coughs> irrigation. The planters you see there are 48 by 48 planters that they put trees in, and I think I have a picture of that in the next slide. Did, slide. did you contact the, the tile manufacturer when you <coughs> drilled holes prior to drilling holes to make sure they're okay with the fact that those holes were drilled? So Yes. <laughs> I can't say their names, but the best people that know how to cut porcelain tile are sitting right in front of me. Um, it's the right tool that's manufactured for porcelain and the method that goes with that. I'll tell you right now, in the dead center, this perfect hole right there with about 16th of an inch, yeah. that is not for the faint of heart. That's somebody that knows what they're doing and has done it a few times. Understand that you're going, when you come to core drilling, you know, pieces of stone and porcelain like this, go ahead and practice before you go to the job site. That's, sure. that's not, your average person getting away with that. And that's, that's, that's also the right bit, the right tool, and the right technique. And that is key. If you go to Lowe's and buy a core bit for porcelain, you are not getting that done unless you got really, really lucky. So, so my, and if my, you went to Lowe's and did that, my I'm concerns are right, are really about compromising the integrity of the tile when you cut, when you drill a hole so close to the edge and you've got point load just on four and you're not fully supported. Is that a concern with the tile manufacturers who make these 2CM papers? Yes, yes, 100%. Um, you know, that's not something. In this particular case, uh, what I probably would have recommended, and I'm sure this is what you guys did, uh, would have been supports actually down from the cross, where the cross is, support down, support up, and support over. Oh, you mean more pedestal? Yeah. They're there. Yep. So just yeah, just yeah. over support it. When yeah. you cut it like I, that, I, just over support it. I can it. actually get the crew that did it, so yeah, they're, they're there. Yeah, they're there. They're yeah. there, right? Yeah. yeah and this may be an instance where you have to use a great system. And you have yeah. to use a su supporting plane underneath because well, you can't do that I think without compromising. I think that's them. probably there too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that. So um, all, all these things are thoughts that you have to have when you're bringing stuff up from underneath the pedestal system before you start installing the pedestal. Absolutely. I think what I want, these, these two slides, I really was kind of playing off what Travis was saying earlier. Look, look, this is interior sunroom working out into an exterior patio with, with porcelain paper, right? One, one is a hard mm -hmm. set over mud, one is pedestal, and if you were looking for load capabilities, yes, those are six caliber trees inside a planter. That, Everybody needs one. That's the thing from a design aspect that I see as the most beneficial thing. It's almost a seamless transition. Yes. Absolutely. And, and, and this is where this, I think for the tile contractors in the room, uh, uh, the, here's the opportunity, right? Here's your opportunity in that. I think the last one, I think we moved to the last case study. We're kind of rolling pretty good on time. It, this goes back to, uh, here's, a, here's the thing, you know, um, this is what we here's this was a uh, house that two sides of it house there's a, in this picture 
houses to the right, houses behind the picture, if you will. I hope that everybody kind of understood that. Um, it, w the question is, this is a tight lot in Atlanta, Georgia, which I think they're all becoming tight lots, um, as urban density. Um, and how are we going to manage, how are we going to daylight the water, right? right? If we we're going to try to do this in a sloping deck or even, even loose laid in the sense of a sloping deck and pulling off, we, we didn't have enough, right. we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough lot to push the water where we needed it, mm -hmm. right? And that, so the solution was we got with the landscape architect, we said, look, let's do slab on grade and, hand, and build this thing just like a roof deck. So in this, and the, really this is about the only picture uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, there's seven drain points, yep. and all the water's coming at more than a quarter inch per foot from the house into the drain point, into those drains you kind of see in the center of the picture. Um, and this is not an uncommon installation practice either. This is not something that's new. Okay? That? It's, this is very common. I just did a 9,000 square foot residence in Columbia, South Carolina on this exact same application. Uh, containment, right? We've got to deal with containment. We've got a slab on grade. Uh, our solution in this case was we five sixteenths inch um, uh, aluminum yep. that was uh, dug down beside the slab. We set it down. It was it, it, it was fourteen inches deep, so we could go down into the slab, maintain our elevation. So you start to think you got to think out where my finished slopes are, where everything's finishing out, and then we tap con it into the slab. Dirt was backfilled onto the aluminum and grass and you don't even see it at the end of the day. I think that's the biggest challenge right now is the, the containment systems are not there. They um, aren't, they aren't. And yeah. so you have to get innovative with your ideas. You have to, we put, we put one with just copper yep. all the way around. It looked great, uh, but uh, it really is something that you have to think outside the box to, I mean, one, we actually uh, set in thinset all the way around We're to doing. do edge containment. Uh, so you really have to think outside the box because the solutions aren't really there right now from the manufacturers of the pedestal systems to create edge containment? I think this is just showing how we start. We're starting at the egress point, string lines. Right. Details, look, here's the detail, right? Not just containment. In this case, we have scuppers. We had, we had put the coping in on the pole. It happened to be travertine. Uh, around the scuppers, uh, we have to, we're <laughs> mudding up. And actually, we're mudding this out, and we're just loose laying over the mud. and that. So it's just to kind of show some of the detailing. Uh, sometimes it gets real narrow, and sometimes we're actually having to use um, mortar pedestals mm -hmm. because we can't. The pedestal base is too big. So, so I think this is kind of you know, there it is, finished project. And that it's not always uh, clean. It's not always we're kind of lonely, but at the end of the day, we put some we, pretty good jobs. We've got about ten minutes uh, for questions because we'd like to hear from what you have to say. If anybody has any questions or yes, concerns, sir. yes, sir. Okay. What you're showing today, but we've been talking about it all week about the pedestals that are here. I just want to make comment that again, if you're going to be doing pedestals on top of a wood, so if you're going to be doing pedestals on top of a wood structure, make sure that it's designed for the weight, um, the dead load, and the and the live load, because most the I think the the PSF for a wood deck is only 15 pounds. And once you start putting pedestals and, a, and the pavers and live load. So gonna, actually, actually, gonna... actually sell uh, a product that goes, it's a great, that goes on a traditional wood frame deck that's actually attached to the joists. Um, and what you'll see, as long as the deck has been built to standard ICC code, that the bulk of the decks don't need reinforcement if it's been built to code. Now, if it's an older deck, the code changed a few years back. So yes, that does need to get looked at. If it's on the new standards, there are equations out, and, and yeah, that's a great point. But wood decks is one thing we did not touch on. Perfect. Wood decking is a perfect application for porcelain. If you take the grates that are available in most manufacturers, domestic manufacturers of porcelain pavers, you can actually take that product as a tile contractor and beat the pricing of composite decking. You can beat it. I, I, I agree with Travis. I see it more as an opportunity on the flip side to that, where 
where you couldn't do a, a, a mud bed and a tire. Somebody's got a, a, a roof deck right. that they can't use because it's got a roof in, and you know, the, the roofing manufacturer doesn't want pedestrian traffic on there that they now want to use as a space. The pedestal system is a perfect example of how to make that space usable. Yeah, we do a lot, quite a few decks because of, and from Minnesota, we get so much freestyle cycles there. Right. And uh, the pedestal system doesn't pedestal care about perfect. freestyle. Yeah. Right. For sure. And, Good and, point. But and they have and to be the, designed. And, and, yeah, and the roofing yeah. membrane becomes maintainable. So instead of a life cycle of 20 years tearing it out, having to take a mud bed back up there, <laughs> you can actually usually save your pedestal systems and your tile, replace your roofing membrane, and put it all back. Yep. So the cost is significantly less than having to do a regular traditional mud set roof deck. But I would, I would encourage highly, and this is something mm -hmm. we're, we're teaching nationally to our contractor bases. Um, as contractors like yourself say you're doing in the interior of a house, look at the wood deck. That's the next available space to you without having to get outside right, of your comfort zone. The decking is a super easy deal. It's already built. There's not, typically, there's not going to be any further uh, inspections that have to happen. It just has to be beefed up, possibly, maybe some cribbing or some blocking done. But that, that should be the next logical step to get you guys outdoors. And then you can start getting down at grade after that. By that, the way, we tile contracts. We don't do cribbing or blocking just to make that <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I got the same. Uh, I got the same application on a wooden deck porch. Uh, we're we're dealing with deflection now, having to have the contractor add uh, decking to support that. Uh, we're going with, uh, we, we've had an on-site visit with noble decking, uh, roof and membrane. Mm -hmm. Would the pedestal system be okay to put on top of noble decking? And it's a two-part question, too. <clears throat> well, I'll answer the, that for the first part. Okay. Eric Edelmeyer is the guy to ask at noble. They've got a booth here. Ask him. And I would say that's good that you asked that question because you always want to get with your roofing manufacturer to see if it can support or it's good for a pedestal system because that not it's not one size fits all here some roofing manufacturers do not want point load on their material like a tpo with foam underneath may not be acceptable they may need added support so you need to get with your roofing manufacturer to make sure that it can accommodate a pedestal system all right uh, my second part of that is <clears throat> one inch travertine laid in a versailles pattern do the pedestal system Underneath, the, the noble deck will be laid and we'll get slope, a uh, quarter inch per foot on, on the decking, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The pedestals adjust, are, are they okay for a Versailles pattern? So you, you'd really want to avoid pedestals in that front. Right, and what right. you look at is using pedestals that actually have girder clips on top. So you'd run joists through. You'd use one of the, the decking systems, the grid decking systems that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of like the sole grid, it's just right. a larger format. And then you'd lay your pattern and you'd leave your joints open or tight or whatever you wanted and it would still flow through. Yeah. But yeah, yeah you the, would, uh, you'd spend $1,000 per square foot in pedestals trying to do a Versailles yeah, you Yeah, the problem, yeah, so, so there's, it's a double, yes, but then there's the fiber grade and, and a, a four by eight sheet of fiber grade is about $1,500 a piece right now. Um, then that would have to support, and then you'd have to build this whole s assembly around it. And so I'd say, no, it doesn't make sense. I think what Travis is talking about, it, it, uh, is it talking about is there, I, I have, it, it gets uber complicated, and I don't think, it, I don't think there's value to the, end, you, to the client at the end of the day. Doing a Versailles pattern with a pedestal system is really, really tricky, and I would try to talk someone out of doing a Versailles yeah. pattern with a pedestal system, to be honest. Right. And I would talk them into it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, because you're a landscaper. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. If you create a structural floor underneath that, what you're saying, yes. support the, the, the tiles. Yeah. I think if you create a structural floor on top of your joists below your tiles, you can do that, yeah. that pattern. Yes. Right. Or any pattern for that matter. Yeah. Um, but the pedestal systems right now are set up for a simpler pattern if yes. you're just doing pedestals. Right. But I think just to touch on before, you talked about wood joist overlays. So you're doing the pedestals on top of a wood frame. And the key there is to have some sort of backing. I've seen a lot of installations where they're just screwing the pedestals to the joists putting the tiles on top, and now you have sometimes a 10-foot you know, void below the yep. tile. No. And as we talked about yeah. before, point load and uh, lawsuits, you definitely want to have 
a structural floor below that yep. that tile or and, below and, those and pedestals. There's there's systems, oddly enough, that have been around for 15 years that no one's ever heard of that I'm pushing in a large way because I've personally used them for six, seven years now. The the availability's there, no one knows about it. And so we're we've chosen with our business, we're stocking heavily to be able to make sure our goal is education, education, education. So when, when these great guys gave me the opportunity to come up here, I said, let's go. Uh, so if, if there's something like that, I'm sure we've got some stores around that you could see the product at least and, and understand a little bit more. And talking about decks too and up in the air, they talked a little bit about wind lift and you saw that video which you said was fake, but I know Travis has seen it. I've seen it on the fifth floor in Manhattan. Um, sure. Fifth floor, fully contained, tiles moving, tiles lifting. So wind lift has to be a consideration when you're doing anything, yep. you know, up in the air like I that. I gotta ask you, Woody, is that Chat GTP? Is that how they did that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> how did they do that? <laughs> I gotta it's, try it's that. Scary. Out. <laughs> Nobody wants forty pound frisbees. It's really no, bad. No, no, no. All right, questions? I think we're out of time, but I uh, want to thank you all for coming this morning and uh, <laughs> being part of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done, sir.